everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Night. I'm Joe. And I'm Jeff. And, and uh, Joe, we were, were we wanted to talk about, well, yes, indoctrination and definitions surrounding indoctrination and and it's it's not its opposite exactly, but what I was thinking about earlier today was how honoring traditions can be important until it becomes indoctrination. Yes. And so the understanding concepts of education, indoctrination, tradition, superstition, uh, right. <clears throat> all of those and how they relate and how one can easily shift into another right. is important. And that's what we're going to talk about. Well, we keep hearing... We hear we hear about indoctrination and grooming in the news a lot yes. lately, and so I wanted to talk about what that actually means and what that that um, accusation implies. Yes, and indoctrination is a pejorative term. It has a negative connotation. What um, some people view as education others will view as indoctrination and so we want to discuss the the right. meanings of those yeah i think the the more recent comment i mean indo indoctrination into the army for instance is a is a thing and still goes on and it's well it's, in induction into the army well those, then, are, those are two things and yes induction is yes but indoctrination is is in fact part of becoming yes. a component in a military machine yes um because you have to well it's a core aspect of indoctrination the goal of indoctrination is to get you to accept without questioning the rules right what you're being taught right um, not merely accept but to to become a champion for and to internalize them yes yeah. so but 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 <laughs> before we begin diving into this further i have a question uh, for you well shoot <laughs> do you perhaps have a beverage this evening that you're partaking of i do as a matter of fact it is um just a sort of well cocktail of blade and bow bourbon mm. and some fever tree ginger beer and a splash of aromatic bitters oh so and okay. you sir what are you imbibing this evening i have <laughs> this is a uh valpolicella oh okay. italian valpolicella dry um yeah, medium bodied uh, oh, really? I, I i tend to remember valpolicella as a more robust it's it's pretty um it's it's not a i wouldn't call this particular one a super heavy body but it's not it's not a light wine either it's fairly substantial okay. drier um uh, tannic good good taste to it so okay Good. Well, cheers. Cheers. So, so, um, we'll talk about teaching to start with because of the definitions of the terms that we mentioned, they all refer to in some sense of teaching, teaching traditions, teaching beliefs, teaching, um, a doctrine well, right. indoctrination i mean that's, <laughs> right it's in the word right right so the so it comes down it, i mean we have to start with the concepts of teaching and as an educator this is something i've given a lot of thought to um <clears throat> i do remember being taught uh, by teachers 
who simply wanted us to accept what they were saying. Right. It was just taking the information. Right. Taking the information and spin it back out. And given the the responses I get from some of my students who are undergraduates and even graduate students, <clears throat> there still must be a lot of that going on. But that's specifically not what I do. I tell them to question everything. I tell them to um, that that I have questioned or disagreed with something on almost every page of almost every textbook I've ever read. <laughs> and that they should question everything, including me. And if I don't have evidence a substantial a logical argument, a logical case to make for what I am telling them, then they, you know, they should question that too. Uh, right. <clears throat> um, and not simply empirical uh, evidence, but um, substantiated evidence. And there's, um, so that's what I'm, I am teaching them to, to be better learners by questioning right. so very socratic in a lot of ways but not i would not call it indoctrination because indoctrination is teaching something where you don't want people to question you want them to accept it as right. unquestionable yes teaching methodology is used in in indoctrination but it's not the same concept except as as I think or a lot of my colleagues think of as educating, being an educator, where you are educating people about how to learn as opposed well, and, to simply trying to pour information in them that they must accept. Well, one would hope <laughs> that from a higher education, one gains the ability to, to reason and critically think as well as simply absorb and regurgitate information. Yes. Yes. So, so that you are you are doing that. You are making sure that your students not only take in the information, that they learn something, but that they learn how to take in and yep. sieve new information. Yes and how to find new information and how to right. analyze it and how to come up with their own original conclusions. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I often uh, <laughs> repeat and have to is how to distinguish a credible source of information from one that's not credible. So it, it's one of the antidotes to indoctrination is education of the yeah. type that I'm describing. Um, so I think it's important to understand <clears throat> the difference because, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> because both can look very similar. Oh, yes. And part, I think, of, in, of, of indoctrination is presenting that information couched in in terms of education. Yes. There were even things called re-education camps. Yeah, and yeah, programming. Right. And, right. Yeah. Programming and deprogramming and all that stuff. Right. These are all things we're familiar with. Yeah. So uh, we talked briefly before we started about how this relates to the virtues. Yes. And we keep coming back often to the foundational virtues of veritas, honesty, um, uh, humility that is recognizing that y you you don't know everything that's part right. of it but uh, honestly recognize recognizing what you do know and the more that the more you know you, the greater your understanding is that there's much more that you don't know right and and the it's, opposite of the dunning kruger so it's the opposite right. end of the right the curve. right and and the courage to to recognize the difference, the, the yes. courage to to self-examine and and take in new information honestly to yes. to 
you know, everybody has a bias. Their cognitive bias is something you, everybody should be constantly fighting against. Yes. Um, but, but you can't just say, I think there's a, a sort of modern common, and so you can't trust anything. Well, yeah, and that that actually is a fallacy of false equivalency, right? And <clears throat> the the it's actually um, a tactic of indoctrination to say you can't trust anything. They're all they're all, except me, except me. Right. Yeah, right. They're all a bunch of liars. Except I'm the only one telling the truth. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's you got to suspect that, right? It's, yes. This is. The, uh, the old joke about the the old the lady watching the the marching band go by and her beaming with pride and saying look there that's my son he's the only one in step <laughs> <laughs> when when it's completely off the topic but um my dad played drums and he was in a veterans group and he marched with his, the veterans group in the Memorial day parade. And he had the bass drum and he was playing the bass drum. Well, traditional Memorial day before it became a three day weekend, May 30th, which was mm -hmm. my father's birthday. Oh, <laughs> so I was convinced that there was a parade because it was my father's birthday because after all, he got the biggest drum. <laughs> they let him play the big drum. Yes. Because <laughs> it was I, his birthday. <laughs> I, told, I told him this, and I must have been like four or five years old or something. And I told him this, and he said, yes, that's actually, absolutely <laughs> exactly <cool."> right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> How clever of you to pick that up. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Um, okay. so, so, yeah, so... So in education yes. comes with and can, can uh, indoctrination can slide in under the auspices of education. Yes. I, I have explained to people who say that it's the often repeated thing, why am I learning this in school? I'm never going to use it. Math, literary analysis, um, whatever. And I say, you're missing the point. The point is to learn to think. Yes. And the content of each class is the subject matter that you are, the ingredients, the material that you are using to learn to think. You can't learn to think in the abstract. I mean, well, with, <laughs> yeah. when you're learning how to think, I mean, there are people who right. think in the abstract, but that's you, you learn to think about concrete things. <clears throat> so that you can examine abstract concepts. Right. But you have to have something to work with. Right. Otherwise, it's you can't make dinner by reading a recipe. You have to actually have ingredients. And right. so that's what the, my analogy for explaining why some subjects are taught in school that people say i'll never use again although i think they're incorrect too well there's some subjects that are that <coughs> traditionally ha are believed to be a basic education yes and, and then often in in a college situation in higher education you you find your aptitude as you learn the basics and you might have already decided i want to be an engineer and then in your class, as you go through classes, you realize that you don't really understand geometry and it's, it doesn't really click for you. So maybe engineering isn't your best course for a career. Yes. Maybe, but you know. you're better off having, knowing something about it. I'm, I, okay. I think there's a, there's a concept um, um, called cultural literacy. It, there was a book about it that came out uh, many years ago. It's been revisited. Um, there, it, there's critiques of it because it, you know, who decides what is 
who's the arbiter of what is necessary. Right. Um, <clears throat> the premise, one way I've heard the premise of this described, is that <clears throat> cultural literacy is the information that you need to be able to read, for example, the front page of the New York Times without having to look up every other word. Okay. Without having to look up, you know, if somebody refers to Pearl Harbor or D-Day or right. Sputnik or <clears throat> the Beatles or something like that. You know, what are those cultural things that, and not necessarily pop culture, because I've, um, I've, I've talked to students about that as well, you know, because how do you, what's your pop cultural reference? How do you understand the popular cultural references of different generations? But <clears throat> I, I think that that's important. But you were mentioning um, the traditional, what was known as the liberal arts. Yeah. And right. the, this, it goes back, the seven liberal arts of the Middle Ages were divided into the trivium, well, they were codified in, in late Roman antiquity, but the trivium and the quadrivium. So grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And right. then geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. So those seven so subjects. It, and it's kind of, that's kind of arts and sciences, kind of. Exactly. A, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which interesting that music is classed with the, in the sciences. sciences yeah yeah well um, but it, and I've, I've never studied music but those i know who have made a study of music recognize that it's it it, it follows a form just like mathematics it is mathematics yes. in fact i've, I've actually used uh, referred to learning music learning to play music in the as an analogy for why learning cursive uh, handwriting is important hmm. because when you are playing music you are playing a note but l you have to and look ahead mm -hmm. while you're playing this note you have to look ahead and see what the next one is to be able to change your fingering or your you know transition how, transition yeah. to that note and you have to look for whether it's a smooth transition or a sharp transition. Uh, and <clears throat> when learning cursive writing at a young age, it teaches you the same thing. You are making this letter form, but depending on what the next letter is, the way it transitions right. into the next one changes. So you have to be doing a thing while thinking of the next thing. And that's... Um, very important in a, as a cognitive development stage it's not merely you know learning motor skills so but education so right um, yes we, we've digressed a little bit yes so traditions um <clears throat> when do traditions become superstitions there's and how are they learned how are these things handed down there's there's been a lot of study of children's games. Mm -hmm. How are these handed down? Because they're not taught in a formal way by adults. They're handed down by children to other children. Um, but so often, they're yeah. often traditional. But when does a tradition become a superstition? Well, I think when... Or does it start as a superstition? Well, I, I, they, may, they may sort of run parallel. I think that many traditions rise out of a superstition and I think the, the, it can go the other way that a, a tradition that's based that that has a reason base that it that it this tradition exists because if we don't do this something goes wrong um yeah and uh but but that that in um original reason may have been lost yes and the tradition only survives and is now a superstition so like 
Friday. Like kissing under the mistletoe. For I mean, just as a harmless example oh, of what okay. that, that comes from the Norse myth, mythological, the pagan traditions of mistletoe was the the one thing in the world that wouldn't harm um, Balder. Or would harm. No. Wouldn't. Well, it would. Yes, it would. It was. It was the one thing that uh, Freya did not ask to not harm Balder because it was so harmless that right. it wasn't necessary. So Loki fashioned the arrow yeah. out of mistletoe, and right. So you and I know the story. I don't want to tell the whole story, yeah. but it's right. so mistletoe is a protection sort of. Um, talisman right, right. Uh, and why it survives into our christmas traditions is the same reason that holly and and evergreen trees do um don't mention the name of shakespeare's scottish play <laughs> we can say theater. macbeth here we're not yeah in the theater. but not in the theater but don't mention it in the theater right um and it's i was in a uh play once in rehearsal and somebody actually said the name in the theater and like a second later part of the set collapsed <laughs> <laughs> it's funny um that one i don't know the origin of but whistling don't whistle backstage um there's all kinds of superstitions well around yeah the, the you don't say good luck you say break a leg well yeah there's but there's a reason for and break a leg is not as some people would have you believe because if you get you're then you're in the cast cast mm -hmm. broken leg. it has to do with the way you bow bowing traditional bowing was not just from the waist it involved putting one foot behind you and bending it as in breaking the line of your leg oh okay. and that was a traditional formal bow the reverence so it was what the reverence yes exactly so it was wishing you that that you will have success enough to take many bows okay i i had never heard that yes that the, the, of it. the whistling backstage because in the early days of theaters with lots of ropes for drops and in the early days of proscenium stages the rope riggers were uh sailors who would w signal to each other by whistling so oh. if you whistled backstage you might something might drop on you that's the story i've heard but i could also said, see how i could also see how a a whistle could be mistaken for the squeal of a rope running through a pulley oh sure very fast which means that there's a sandbag coming down right, at a high right. rate of speed <laughs> so the the um I did once um, tell somebody who whistled backstage and everybody was upset. I said, um, okay, there's a, there's a solution. You have to stand on <laughs> your another head. Tradi there's another, so super another tradition. You have to stand on your head and sing, give my regards to Broadway. And that will take care of the, the problem. I'm, made that i mean i may have heard that somewhere but uh, you know i may have heard it or i'm uh, i don't remember i think i heard it somewhere but it was important for the rest of the cast and crew to know that it had been dealt with so i said here i'll cancel this one out with another one um okay but and that that superstition probably lives on in that particular theater to this day probably <laughs> um <clears throat> I, may, I may have i must have heard it somewhere but um i think i may have heard it as a as a um as a cure for an earworm because ah. um, i've done that before and it works standing on your head and singing no no you don't have to <laughs> but just you get an earworm you know a ah. song that is you can't get out of your head you sing give my regards to broadway and it'll it'll go away and then you might have give my regards to Broadway stuck in your head, but most people don't know all the words to that, so it doesn't last. Well, I think that's why in my theory about earworms is that it's because you don't know the whole song. 
you, it's an earworm because you're playing the same part of a song over and over again. And the only way to cure that is to find all of the lyrics and sing the song from beginning to end. Okay. And then you're done. There you and go. And you can close it. Your, your mind can put past it. and Well, and that's day. similar to something that I also not only teach but do in my own uh, my own life is that I write things down because um, there's an old saying that faintest ink is better than the best memory. Yes. So you have an idea, write it down. But if you are working on developing ideas for something and you get stuck, you have to write them down because it's the only way to get them out of your head to make room for new ideas is write <laughs> okay. them down because you get stuck otherwise. Uh, creatively stuck so for me the act of writing something helps me memorize it yes just writing i could i could write it down and then throw away the note and i would still remember it better than if i hadn't written, written it down that. yes there's um without getting into it too deeply the kinesthetic sense of um has has a connection to memory for certain kinds of learning processes that yeah. people do but um it's why um most educators i know advocate to their students that they write notes by hand in class rather than simply type because if you're taking notes you are often just transcribing without filtering but one of the most interesting things i heard um, and I think it's a great idea for students, is um, uh, they created, uh, students created a Google Doc and invited everyone in the class to it, and they all took their notes from class lectures in the same Google Doc. So they they all add, found add different pieces and and huh. different information and stuff and they were the most extensive and accurate notes that anybody had ever taken and they all had access to them wow that's that's interesting yeah i think that's a great uh use of technology yeah that situation huh. so and it's communal learning which yes. is an interesting yes. concept where we we stress the our education system stresses the individual ability to take in and, and parrot information yes. and being able to learn communally with help from a community, I think is interesting. Um, mm. Now, regarding traditions, you and I have both uh, moved, modified, shifted traditions. Um, over in, time. Yeah. Over time in ceremony. Incremental and changes and, yeah. to um, long-held <laughs> traditions. Yes. Um, having the a view that simply because it's a tradition doesn't mean it can't be improved. Right. But also understanding that for a lot of people, traditions have more force than rules. Well, you certainly, yeah. when you try and change your tradition, you certainly find that to be true. Yes. But that it's possible to change them traditions meet people's expectations so if you are changing things you have to satisfy those expectations but in a new way or in a slightly altered way in the incrementally different way right exactly well and part of recognizing that like as i was saying earlier that tradition existed for a reason so you need to recognize that reason Yes. If it, if it still exists, you need to recognize that so that you're changing it without losing the reason that it exists in the first place. Yes. Yes. So, and traditions aren't by themselves bad. Traditions can provide community and stability. Um, you know, there's a, a comfort in, in many traditions, you know. Yes. Knowing what you're getting or what you're, that you are a part of something that has existed 
before you and will exist after you that you have that you're part of this thing and and maintaining those traditions has value in a community yes it it's one of the ways that um communities are built through right. traditions um and and they're Im important and communities are important um so but it's possible to change those um otherwise we end up with like the e plebnista yeah, yeah right yeah where the meaning has been lost lost that's a um, star trek original series reference by the way uh, <laughs> for for those of you who don't, who don't know the yangs yeah. and the combs and yangs and the combs <laughs> yeah. uh, the, um i think there's also the idea of training rules and discipline in in related in a related way and there are depending on the subject there are times when rules absolutely must be adhered to because there's a safety yeah. concern you know if you are if you are learning welding which is mm -hmm. has or any kind of significant tool use there are dangers to it and you have to follow certain rules but i think it's also important that you understand why those rules exist not simply first you follow them but you should also be learning why you're following them well, why yeah, I, I, ideally you're taught why when you're taught yes rule, right so you need to do this because if you don't you're you'll go blind right right <laughs> using using my mother's uh reasoning for a lot of things well, <laughs> um <clears throat> but i i think there are there's also a saying that you have to learn the rules to know when you can before you can understand how to break them and i've right or, I've or when you when you can abandon them yes I think it's more right breaking um, them is not isn't the goal the goal is moving past them past them right but you you learn in a certain way and then you can move past it um right. and well, i think fact, that's, that's true in a lot of disciplines sure you, you master these things master these techniques that everybody else has to learn before you you take off in your own direction right right uh, the great the great artists especially in the modern era right picasso right. jackson pollock are really went in their own directions yeah. but had mastered all these sort of classical techniques yes. first well and if you if you look even even going back further there were um there were changes as materials changed for example so the first um painters to start really using oils when those came in instead of tempera uh, instead of yeah but they were first using them as glazes over tempera mm -hmm. which is why you'll see things like botticelli's work is often sometimes listed as as tempera and sometimes let's say oil because it's mm -hmm. oil glazes over tempera mm -hmm. um but then you've got people really experimenting with the the methods and techniques you've got people experimenting with with um perspective and then applying rules to it and figuring that out so there's but you can see the the those changes over over time then you've got some real significant changes in the as you said in the modern era or starting with impressionism but well i, re I but, remember reading that monet one of the yeah. premier impressionists was in fact like like beethoven was going deaf monet was going blind oh but that was half of his career that was much later so when he started when he started with impressionism this is my theory anyway which is mine and mine <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that <laughs> in a traditional academic painting as it was taught whoa, 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 hold on my chair is malfunctioning oh. excuse me okay there we go sorry <laughs> okay the air, the air piston in my chair is giving out and i was trying to adjust it and it failed yes. utterly <laughs> and but as a side effect you now appear to have a tan that you didn't know that's weird isn't it ago. well I'm a little embarrassed by my chair, so that could okay. Yeah. I'm just maybe not tan so much as flushed. Yes. <laughs> so, at a certain point in the traditional 19th century academic painting, colors are applied, but in what you might refer to as impressionistically areas of color, but then they're blended. And my theory is that that Monet said screw it with the blending i like this it optically blends when i stand mm -hmm. at a distance i'm going to take this as my point of departure and push it further and then the other people went to there without going through the same academic training and simply started with impressionism and one of my biggest critiques of training teaching of art classes art programs is that um they lost the significant structure of here's the process here's the rules here's the method learn this and then you can right. go yeah on. but well, so like, without giving people that grounding in it so well, it's like trying to learn jazz as your you know as a beginner yeah but you don't you, it's hard to study jazz until you study classical music and classic well, theory you certainly have to understand scales and technique and of right. whatever instrument and you have to understand that to be as the point of departure but that's also one of the criticisms i have of music education in mm -hmm. in schools is that they teach students to play music they don't teach students how to make music mm. how to improvise how to compose how to make original music and so i think that's i think that's also missing but well i wonder if that's a again a, a higher education thing whereas in in high school band you're learning how to you're learning how to work your instrument and then it's not until you become a, a the higher levels in college or studying it as a master's thing where you where you're you're um encouraged to take find your own direction i i think that's too late hmm, okay in that myself but for some students certainly the ones who are getting a grasp on on the instrument um i think need to learn they need to see the path forward okay and sometimes that's not not laid out so the the training uh, music education is really geared towards for people who pursue it being a musician in a symphony instead of being a musician making their own music necessarily okay a writer songwriter singer type improviser jazz musician something so okay. but <clears throat> um and that's that's discipline that's yes. what we're talking about there is discipline yes well and discipline has all of these have several meanings but discipline is i i use it there are many different disciplines within this thing right a, a specific um <clears throat> thing you study a thing you practice a yes. discipline but discipline also refers to a kind of rigid rules-based learning these are the rules and you are well disciplined it, to those well it also means self-control there's self-discipline but there's also yeah. imposed discipline you, you, well yes yeah, certainly an, an organization may like a, the military for instance will Im, impose a a discipline and that mm -hmm. discipline is following the rules here's yes. the rules 
the discipline is that you will always follow those rules in in a predictable fashion. I, uh, since I already told one story about my father, I'll add another one. <laughs> um, my father, who was drafted six months before Pearl Harbor, and then was in for the duration, um, had he was he told me that there was an inspection, so they were all you know at their at their bunks with their foot lockers all open and they were standing at attention and some general came through and there he's looking and he looks at my father's trunk. He says, that's, that's out of order. That shouldn't be there. And my father said, it's according to regulations, sir. And it regulates according to regulation number. And he mm -hmm. cited the number in the book. Chapter and, chapter and yes. verse. And the, <laughs> and the, and the uh, general said, to the commanding officer, put this man on report and and left. And the CO said, report to my office in half an hour and you better be right. <laughs> my father can, reported to the commanding right. officer with the regulations and cited it. And he was correct. And the CO said, yeah, well done. <laughs> All right. You're dismissed. Better hope you don't run into that general again. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. and so I think we've covered we've covered this, but there's one thing I wanted to to bring up. Part of what uh, inspired me to bring this subject up is the use of the word indoctrination in our modern we hear in the news now is a hypocrisy because what the people who are who are talking about indoctrination in our schools are the people that were raised as children to go to a specific church and are raising their children to go to the same church so the it's what they're objecting to is what they perceive as indoctrination that's different from the than indoctrination theirs. they want to impose exactly exactly yes so this is and this is why I bring it up and why we should be wary of it. Indoctrination is a pejorative term when it's somebody else's. Yeah, when someone's trying to do it to you, it's yes. okay when you're doing it to somebody else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, once again, the the hypocrisy of of some people is something that needs to be called out. Yes, as we often seem to do. We do. Um, although I have sadly come to realize that you cannot shame people for their hypocrisy when they have no sense of shame no but like a, you're right and i'm not trying to change those people i'm trying to pull people to my side of the fence yes i guess or not pull them but let them know that it's okay the side of the fence is okay you know, there's other people over here there's a lot of noise on that side of the fence but if you're sitting on the fence be decide for yourself what side you're going to step off on well and i think i think the the point you are making and the what you're talking about has a lot of parallels because the oh you people are not thinking for yourself you're just sheep yeah because you are not accepting our indoctrination right you're accepting the other people's in what they view as indoctrination so who's who's the you know you're you're you believe this you accept this these this side says you're you're being indoctrinated then and, and vice versa and so um well that's and that's why i think it's i'm I'm a little suspicious of of people who who adopt a whole uh, adopt wholesale a philosophy or or I I consider myself part of this group and I and I'm adopting all of their ideology. That's I think is absolutely dangerous. Yeah. I mean you can you can consider if we're talking about like the left right spectrum I would I would consider myself to the left of moderate 
certainly. And as the as the scale changes in our definitions lately, I'm yeah. getting further and further left, and I haven't moved. It's the scale yeah. has moved. Yes, yes. So, um, and that's why I describe my own philosophy as ethical pragmatism. Right. And, what and is? Hmm? And and I don't apply an ism to myself. <laughs> well, yes, but what I'm describing is nobody else's ism it's my own ism so, right um but it encourages um, others because you've created an ism now you can have other people that can adopt it yes <laughs> hey if yeah um now you can start indoctrinating people hey, <laughs> yeah like yeah sure um <laughs> so that that was my impetus for this whole thing about what what actually is indoctrination and when does it become dangerous and where what are its uses and how can it be put to uh, to use for evil <laughs> i guess well i think it becomes and and i think it becomes dangerous when you are not allowed to question when when you're not allowed to question because then you are not being taught to think logically to think critically you're only being taught to obey well and we see that from from political standpoint we're seeing that also from both sides well i have recently found that um without getting too deeply into specific current events which we may <laughs> keep for another time that uh i'm finding uncritical thinking about issues from a, all, all across the spectrum of mm -hmm. political thought that people have accepted as true certain things that they've heard without critically analyzing them without looking at evidence right. and like i was saying i think it's about yeah. this whole body of ideology you you want to belong to this group therefore you you believe all of all of these things yeah and i i find it i i'm finding it that i've expected certain kinds of uncritical thinking from um certain certain segments of the political spectrum it but when i see it from other from people with with whom i agree on a number of issues mm -hmm. i i find it much more disturbing because they're accepting as true things that um uh they're they're accepting as true things are as uncritically as uh anyone yeah. else is and there's a conformity among what? there's a conformity among non -con let's all be non-conformist <laughs> in the same way exactly um, yeah and um like the punk movement no we're all rugged individuals let's all dress alike yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah and but but again this is this is community and humans i think need community and and innately cleave to communities yes. one way or another yes it's it's difficult and i mean uh i think some of the greatest thinkers in modern history are the ones who say think for your who say and mean it think for yourself and and, the, and and point out how difficult that actually is yes yes um and i <laughs> i have found myself in the position at times of disagreeing with someone simply because of who they because 
because I didn't want to agree with them because <laughs> <laughs> this person is despicable. They can't be right about this. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, and that's that's a flaw too. Just like it's a flaw to agree with someone who for this on the same basis um so so <laughs> so eh, well, here we are yeah once yeah. again um we're 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 recognizing that we're not perfect about with any of this stuff yeah. um we're trying to keep ourselves cognizant of all of this by making you all cognizant of all yeah, this. Yeah, and by talking about all of this. Yeah. So we're we're trying to keep ourselves honest. Yes. Veritas by by having these discussions. And uh, that's why thank you Joe for for keeping up with this because this has been a great thing I think for me personally. Yes. And me too. And um and I think this subject is uh, that we're talking about tonight is really important because Mark Twain said a lie will travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Right. And I, I think that. And that, it, and there's a, there's a similar quote. Um, and I don't remember who, by whom it said that. And it, it's, it, it's kind of a pose there that says the, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Turn it loose and it will defend itself. Only, only if we can look critically at the arguments one way or the other. That if, yes. if evidence and reasoning are our guidelines, then yes, truth is it can be self-evident. Yeah. Unfortunately, lions can be taken down by a pack of hyenas. <laughs> an excellent corollary <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah very good you know what yeah. i think i may make our next meme i'll find that first quote and yeah. i'll put your core and i will credit you as the corollary <laughs> joe's corollary <laughs> <laughs> okay that's good okay i like it all right yeah. okay is that this weekend i need to put up I one I think it probably um, is. Yeah, next. Okay. Um, uh, we have another episode going up soon. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, then, so, like, I, like, we use this to keep ourselves honed against each other. You should all share yes. and like us and subscribe and all those things because this has got to be valuable to you if it's valuable to us. Yes. And... <laughs> We are within sight of our 100th episode. Yes. So we're that, in the 90s now. Are we now? I thought we were our, only in the 80s. No, in our episodes, we are in, in the 90s. Okay. So we will, will be discussing things we might do for our 100th episode. And um special things well, we we have also agreed to to uh evaluate the value of of our little discussions for for a public venue at at the 100th episode yeah yeah so if we don't get some kind of feedback <laughs> that, yeah. that this this all this isn't just going out into the void and being lost you need to give us some feedback let us know that that you're interested in the stuff we yes. talk about and that we should continue because we'd be happy to if it's if it's worth it to all yeah. of y'all so if if you really want us to put all these episodes on a gold record and launch <laughs> it into space yeah donate <laughs> <laughs> after you subscribe be sure to donate <laughs> so that we can make one gold record <laughs> And we'll totally do that. We'll totally make a gold record. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but until then, um, and until we see you next time, 
uh, please be thou a good night. And true. Thank you.